Okay, hi. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of the background um, of, of where I've come from. So I uh, graduated and trained as a, um, as a doctor, and I actually practiced as a doctor. Um, and uh, shortly after practicing, I uh, uh, worked on a leprosy colony. Um, and in the leprosy colony, I was really struck by the way that patients or people that were part of the community were actually using really low-tech devices in order to reconstitute their being. It's, it had nothing to do with anatomy in the end. It was about belonging. Um, and so there were very simple devices like um, uh, uh, leather straps that would um, be tied around the big toe and attached to the knee um, that would stop foot, um, feet kind of dragging on the ground and therefore opening up the flesh and getting infected so then bones would start to be melted by bacteria. Um, and one that really intrigued me was um, a big pot of wax that everybody used to use when they had um, nasal um, uh, sag. It's called um, a lion face that people had when they had um, leprosy, where the uh, leprosy eats the soft palate, uh, so it eats cartilage and it eats the cartilage of your nose, so that all this um, part of the, the face um, falls flat. And so with the um, big pot of wax, they'd uh, mold themselves a nice pointy nose and stick it up through the big hole in the, in the roof of their mouth, and then um, give themselves really pointy noses. Um, but they also, uh, it surprised me as a, as a junior doctor then that um, people took pride in their aesthetics um, and that, you know, what kind of glasses that you actually wore um, over your pointy nose really mattered. Ray-Ban were definitely in. Um, and um, the other thing that, um, that, that, that we were doing was um, doing tendon transfers. So um, we would take um, tendons from the fingers um, and insert them into the thumb so that people could have a functional grip. And um, we could do that in the middle of nowhere because uh, somebody with a leprous body does, can't feel. So we don't need an anesthetist. There's no anesthetic risk. The other thing we could do is split the temporalis muscle here and insert it instead of into the jaw, into the eye. So then not only did you get your um, dark glasses, but you could also chew gum so that when you chewed, you would blink your eye. And so these, these rewirings and reconfigurations and reimagining of the body um, set me off on this path of thinking about, okay, so I'm a medical doctor, I've learned the Gray's anatomy, I've spent hours in an anatomy lab trying to normalize and regulate what it means to be human. Um, and all of a sudden I go to a, 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 a community of people with leprosy and everything's turned on its head. So what the hell does that mean? And so that question actually um, uh, stayed with me and it's never really gone away. And that really is the framing for, for where, I, where I come from in terms of uh, the, the things that I did next. So when I came back to the UK, um, you know, there, there weren't really um, the opportunities that I'd had in India to um, study, uh, I guess, the cultural, social, and um, I guess, aesthetic effects of um, being alternatively bodied. Um, and um, so I started to work with performance artists like Orlan. And um, the thing that actually attracted me to Orlan's work was the fact that she'd actually completely and utterly inverted the power structure in the anatomy um, uh, theater. So no longer was the surgeon the high priest. Um, it was this fabulous woman, a complete diva, uh, who, who changed the, um, uh, the attire of the operating theater so that, um, you know, that she was dressed in uh, Paco Raban or Issy Miyake. Um, they had grapes that they were eating during the operation. It was burlesque. You know, there were naughty bits knocking out of, of holes that you really, you know, that were designed to be there. And the surgeon was really, really backstage. Um, and so this kind of reclamation of the power of the body, because if you think about it, um, you know, the, the body in a surgical theater is very, very vulnerable, very vulnerable. I mean, you, you know, the, there's this whole hierarchy of order and, and a, a complicity and an attraction trust that you um, place uh, in the hands of a surgeon. And, and in some ways, you know, we, we're kind of glad that that happened. But, but Orlan's radical moves into you know, the, the politics of the body through this performance really, really intrigued me. And I was really keen to uh, uh, explore that a bit more. And so I, I worked with Stellark on a seven-year project was to um, 
uh, to develop an extra ear. He came to me one day with the idea that he was going to put this ear, an extra ear on the side of his face. Um, and, you know, having read my anatomy books, I said, well, that's right over the facial nerve. You'll end up with a one-sided palsy if you put your ear on your, your extra ear on your face. So I introduced him to some um, uh, plastic surgeons. And after a seven-year uh, journey, uh, he um, uh, eventually had it uh, recited on the um, underside of his left forearm and also had a blue tooth um, uh, chip inserted there. But that had to be uh, surgically removed. And actually, it was quite interesting because both Orlan and Stellark had trouble with implants. There was an awful lot of infection. And I'm not sure whether that was just because um, cosmetic surgery was really, was really just only starting. We would only really just had the first generation of um, uh, uh, local anaesthetics. I mean, the early 90s was when we started to be able to, to put people um, uh, comfortably, um, not quite to sleep, but actually to, to, to put them into a state where you could operate and they couldn't feel, but they could remain awake. Um, so before then, you had to have a general anaesthetic. And that really was the technology that started to change the relationship between um, bodies and intervention. And, and it does, it does uh, um, intrigue me now how many body hackers there are that, that, that do uh, self-mutilation or self-modification um, without any anaesthetic, because uh, you know, there's, 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 there's a number of them around. Um, but. Um, what I wanted to um, quickly say, and I'm sure there's a, a time limit on this, was that all these um, uh, collaborations that I'd done, I mean, and, and Orlan and Stellark were, were just, just a couple, um, uh, made me think about the framing of the human body in the 21st century. I'd grown up uh, with the assumption that the body was a machine. So that machine metaphors you know, lead to ideas about cyborgs or the idea of a singularity where we're actually becoming a machine, a kind of a, a super being that, you know, like Stellark was exploring, you know, somehow rather harder and drier and more suited to extraterrestrial existence. Um, and um, as essentially, uh, I decided to reject the idea that the, that the uh, body was actually a machine. And, and really, it's uh, been a, a millennial re le a revelation for me. There are about four factors that are, that are coming into play. The first is that we're a, um, a, an age of, we've, we've had our first generation of digital natives. So that we're used to being connected to everything, um, that identity quite seamlessly within a single person can be a whole bunch of contradictions. We're a different person at home, different person on the internet, different person at work. We may not even be the same person at work in the morning as in the afternoon. That's okay, you know, and, and nobody, you know, that's not necessarily crazy. Um, the other thing is that um, over the course of the 20th century, there's been a rise of a very interesting science that has a different ontology to classical scientific discourse, and that is complexity. Complexity looks at networks of interactions. It looks at process. It looks at um, forms of organization and systems. So it's a different way of thinking about the way that the world works to, say, an object-oriented hierarchy. Um, the next thing, of course, is our ecological crisis, so that uh, we are now aware that the world in which we are immersed is not static and made up of um, um, objects that are uh, uh, organized in, uh, passively in, in, in a form of hierarchy, but actually, you know, it's, it's more of a Heraclitean universe where the whole place is in a continual flux, whereas machines don't sit within that organizational paradigm very, very comfortably at all because they operate um, from a design perspective of equilibrium, whereas our nature is at non-equilibrium. So, so these, these, these paradigms kind of all converging at the beginning of this millennium and actually changing our framing of reality. And I'm going to suggest that the body is no longer a machine, but it's an ecology. Or, as I've been trying to um, express, an ecology, instrumented ecologies, because they're not passive. We're actually culturally editing, um, socially conditioning the assemblages, these, these heterogeneous groups of agents that are always moving around, always interacting with each other. And unlike cybernetic systems, they're capable of making a radical act of transformation. And so I think that there is a new way of framing the technology, the ordering of the body, 
um, that will give us new insights into identity. It will challenge power structures, you know, forms of dichotomy, you know, like mind-body splits, nature, um, and uh, the synthetic. Um, and so, so I, I think that you know we are actually. Uh, I think these these ideas about cyborgs are start. You know, they're, they're they're looking at new groupings of things within. I, I guess still the old machine paradigm. I'm going to call the machine paradigm an old paradigm. I'm sure I'll get challenged on that. I don't care. Um, but the machine paradigm is an old 20th century idea about the body. We are these very fluid um, collections of uh, interacting. Uh, um, far from equilibrium material systems that are always reinventing, always forming new relationships. And these are not just physical, they are also cultural and social. Um, and so I think with that framing, we'll start to be able to see new possibilities for self-identification, for cultural editing, a great deal more tolerance, perhaps, that we have of, of difference than perhaps, say, that my Grey's Anatomy would have dictated. And, and I think that if we went on a very long journey to interstellar space and um, we uh, you know, eventually met again at the other side and we'd separated on two spaceships and, you know, meet at Alpha Centauri. We, you know, the two spaceship colonies may look incredibly different, but I think there would still be absolutely no contradiction if they were both to call themselves human. So that's all I really want to say.